Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It is Wednesday morning, August 18th, 2021. Got folks joining on the stream here on the church page, and then also I've got it open on the Near Churches page. Good morning, Diana and Linda and Connie. Good to see you guys. And we have quite a few others who are on and not commenting, and that's okay. Glad that you are here. There's Gail. We are in Acts chapter 8 today. We're going to finish the chapter. We did the first 25 verses yesterday. Uh, good morning, Gene Bailey. We covered uh, the gospel going to Samaria. You recall all the Christians, except for the apostles, left Jerusalem because of the intense persecution. And then the, the, next, the very next account is Philip going down to the city of Samaria and preaching Christ to them. And uh, he does that. The gospel, of course, produces Christians. And then he goes on to, uh, to an individual. So if you have any questions or comments as we're going, please feel free to use the comment section. Good morning, Lyle. And I will tell you, I don't know if you can hear it in the background, but it's raining a pretty good bit here in Mammoth Spring, finally. And so if you hear a little background noise, I'm under a metal roof here. That might be the noise that you hear. Good morning, Brian. All right, Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. We start reading, uh, and the first, I guess I would say, individual that we read about is an angel. And we're going to read about the we're going to read about an angel. We're going to read about hey, good morning, Derek. We're going to read about um, the Holy Spirit, the eunuch, and Philip. Now it's interesting in this account that um, the Holy Spirit is communicative an angel is communicative and yet neither one of them speak to the guy who needs to be taught the truth you know it's a very common common thought that people have that you know if they're going to be brought to Christ that they're going to have some type of experience you know the holy spirit is going to uh in some way communicate with them good morning uh, sheila the Holy Spirit's going to some way directly communicate with them, speak to them in their ear, you know, lay something on their heart. I think that's probably the most prominent way people uh, present this this idea that they have or they have a dream, something along those lines. Good morning, Owsleys. If the Bible were to teach something like that, this would be the number one text to do it. Because you have a man, the Ethiopian eunuch, who is a worshiper of God, He's traveled approximately 1,500 miles one way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he's reading the Scriptures. This is the perfect opportunity if a religiously-minded person is going to have an experience. If an angel or the Holy Spirit were going to directly communicate with someone about their needs, about what they needed to do to be saved, this is it. But let's look at the text and see what the Bible teaches. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert, or this is a, it's a deserted area. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near, over Go near and overtake this chariot. So, again, the angel communicates to Philip. The Holy Spirit communicates to Philip. Here's where you go, the angel says, and then the Holy Spirit directly says, go get this guy. Go to that chariot, and uh, this is the one that you're going to communicate with. And um, he's, he's reading the Bible, Isaiah specifically, and he, he asks an interesting... So Philip does that. He goes and joins himself to the chariot. And Philip asked him a question, do you understand what you're reading? And that's a question that we should, we should ask ourselves, and perhaps if we don't, maybe we should ask somebody uh, who, who knows the Bible, who's a, who's a biblical student. Help me understand this. Well, how can I, verse 31, unless someone guides me? And there you go. He needs instruction. The word guide there in the Greek language literally means to lead out. So how can I understand what the Bible is saying in some, unless someone brings it out for me, presents it to me? Um, you know, the seed, we're told in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, the seed is the word of God. If you want to have a Christian, 
you need to plant the proper seed. And that's what's getting ready to happen here. How can I, unless someone uh, leads me in this direction? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in which uh, the place in the scriptures which he read was this: He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer, shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Of course, you know the eunuch reading that Old Testament scroll, the prophet of Isaiah, um, has this question, which, which would be a natural question if, you know, you think about it, if all you had access to, let's say, of all 66 books, if all you had access to was Isaiah, and you're sitting there reading Isaiah 53, and the prophet's talking about what he's talking about there in Isaiah 53, it would be very possible that you could come to the conclusion that Isaiah was speaking of something that was going to happen to him personally in the future. Thankfully, we have all the Bible, and we know exactly what Isaiah 53 is talking about. And one of the things also we pick up here is the fact that Christianity is a taught religion. You're not born a Christian. I don't care if your parents and grandparents were Christians and faithful and how strong they were. If you do not obey the gospel, if you are not born again, you are not a Christian. You know, your, your, your family history with whatever is absolutely worthless. And so you have passages like uh, John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, where you must be born again. Well, that's every person needs to be born again. You have another passage like John 6, verses 44 and 45, that tells us that if you want to come to the Father, you've got to be drawn well, the drawing then, according to verse 45, is if you want to come to the Father, you must hear and learn. Christianity is a taught religion. You know, Judaism, if you were born to Jewish parents, the moment you were, the moment you came forth, let's say, you were, in, you were born into that covenant. You were a Jewish person from that point on. That was sealed, if you were a male, by circumcision on the eighth day. And then you were taught that religion as you grew. Christianity is the exact opposite. You are born, you are, you are perfect, you're innocent, you reach an age of what we call the age of accountability, and there's no set age, it's different for everybody, but you realize what sin is, you realize uh, it's an offense to God, you learn about Christ and the church and salvation, and you decide to obey the gospel. And so you're not born into Christianity, you're born again to become a Christian. And that's exactly what this eunuch needed to do here. So the eunuch answered, verse 34, I ask of you, who's he talking about? Well, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, Isaiah 53, preached Jesus to him. So this is another one of those accounts that I've mentioned. I think it was yesterday I mentioned it, that there are many accounts in the book of Acts where we have like Peter in Acts 2 and Peter in Acts chapter 3 where you do have the content, okay, Acts chapter 7 with Stephen, you know what they preached, the details are given, but then you have accounts like Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, where Philip, the only thing we're told that Philip preached in Samaria was the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, well, there's a lot that falls under that umbrella of subject matter, and then here we're told even less, he began at the same scripture and preached Jesus to him, and so Obviously, he preached Isaiah chapter 53 and, and explained that, but, but he taught something else, too. You know, Isaiah 53, so far as I can tell, doesn't talk about baptism. But look at the inference that the eunuch made uh, at the preaching of Philip. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And this is such an amazing text to me because all we know is that he preached Jesus. And the very next thing we're told is the eunuch had reached this conclusion when he saw water, hey, I need to be baptized. What's stopping me from doing this? It's amazing that, you know, there, there are a lot of people today that say, well, you just preach Jesus. You don't teach any kind of plan. Just teach Jesus. This one passage right here silences forever that, that ridiculous argument. He preached Jesus. And the conclusion from him having preached Jesus, the conclusion that the eunuch reached was, I need to be baptized. Well, I mean, that's the Great Commission. You know, that goes back to um, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, and, and then you go to Acts chapter 2, and, and so on. 
This is the Great Commission. To preach Jesus, then, part of that, obviously, is to preach about baptism. And so, what happens? What hinders me from being baptized? Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you have hearing the gospel in this account, obviously. You have belief. You have confession. And you have baptism. You know, people say, and I've heard this, and perhaps you've, you guys have heard this before too. Well, you know, there's no one verse that tells you all five steps to be saved. And you know what? That's absolutely true. But you have all these different accounts through the book of Acts. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. Um, here, you have confession and being baptized. Uh, the Corinthians, Acts chapter 18, verse 8. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. So you have those different things listed, but in every single account of conversion, after the establishment of the church on the day of Pentecost, in every account, you have baptism. You may not always have repentance. You'll always have baptism. You may not always have confession. You will always have baptism. And so that's the... When, when, when Philip, having preached Jesus, that was the logical conclusion that the eunuch came to. Here's water... What's stopping us from doing this? Well, do you believe? Yes. Well, he then made the confession. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And then notice how the, and again, you know, I, you've, if you've listened to me any length of time, you've heard me say this kind of thing before. There's no word in the Bible by accident. So notice carefully verse 38. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water... The word baptize itself, the English word baptize, comes from the Greek word baptizo, and it means to dip. It means to, to immerse, all right, to bury. You're buried in baptism. It's what the, that's the language Paul uses in Romans 6. He uses it in Colossians 2 and verse 12. Baptism is a burial, and it takes both people going into the water. Unless Now, actually, I've baptized somebody without being in the water, uh, it was at a church camp, and all we had was a, I think it was a, some kind of cattle trough filled with water. Well, I stood on the outside and immersed the person in the trough. I mean, that works too, so long as they are baptized. But the point being here, uh, the eunuch wasn't sprinkled. The eunuch didn't have water poured on him. They both went down into the water, and they both were baptized. No, they, they both went down into the water, and they both came up out of the water. Baptism is a burial. Uh, Gene Bailey asked, does believe also denote repentance and confession? And that is an excellent question because let me, let me show you an example of this. Um, let's see here. Acts chapter 6 and verse 7, a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Well, you know, the faith is the gospel. We know that from passages like Jude verse 3, but all we're told is they were obedient to the gospel. Again, when you go throughout the entire book of Acts, you learn what that looks like. You learn what that means. There are times when believe denotes everything, absolutely. Um, whether it's repentance or confession or baptism, it's, it's, a, it's a part that stands for the whole. And that's actually a form of speech. I cannot, I'm wanting to say metonymy, but I may not be right there, but it's the part standing for the whole. Uh, the Ephesians, for instance, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul talks about when they believed. Well, you can read about that in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, and you see that it involved all of that. So good question. And, and sometimes belief does denote everything that a person does to become a Christian. And now, of course, sometimes it doesn't. Of course, you know, context will give you the, will give you the, the meaning of that term, the way it's being used. But here in Acts chapter 8... Um, we have him believing what's being preached. We have him making the great confession, and we have him being baptized. And so we have all of those different things present in this one text. And so back to what we were looking at. Just let me look at my outline here real quick. Um, yeah, not a lot to add there. So this is what it means to preach Jesus. Part of preaching Jesus is obviously preaching baptism. And preaching baptism not just... You know, a very common belief in baptism is that it, that it, that you're already saved, and then you are baptized at a later point to, 
to become affiliated with some local church. And of course, that's nowhere in the Bible. That's very prominent, particularly among the, the Baptist denomination. Um, I've had, I've, I've done some, a few years ago, some coaching in this area, softball. My daughter was on softball team, and these girls came to the dugout one night for practice, and they, they were telling, of course, they knew I was a preacher, and they are like, uh, I got saved last night. I had two of them tell me. They got saved last night. And I said, man, that's great. When were you baptized? And they said, we haven't been. And so we had a little discussion in the dugout about that. But a lot of people have that common belief that you believe, and then sometime later you are baptized thus identifying you with that church where you had your salvation experience. Well, that's not how it works. The Bible doesn't teach that anywhere. Uh, that's, that's, that's a man-made doctrine and not a, not a doctrine from heaven. So they both go down into the water, and he buried him. And they both come up out of the water, verse, nine, uh, verse 39. The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he, the eunuch, went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, the, the, a way we might know this better is Ashdod, the Old Testament. It's, that was one of the Philistine cities. Philip was taken to Ashdod, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So uh, just a very interesting account here of a man who was, uh, what I would say, is doing the best he could with the knowledge that he had. He had come from Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. He was reading the Scripture and he was led to obedience by a man who, all we are told, preached him Jesus. Acts chapter 8, verses 35 and 36. Passages like this really help us understand the gospel plan of salvation, uh, as we call it. Diana says, because to believe means you understand and believe, those, believe that those things must happen to be saved. If, you're, you know, if your faith is in the right place, you're going to do what Jesus tells you to do. I, I can't tell you over the years how many, how many back and forths I've had with people about Mark 16, 16. You know, Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. And they always come back with, well, he didn't say and not be baptized. If you have the proper faith, you're not going to make an argument to try to argue against what the Bible says. If you want to do what God says, you're going to accept what He says, and you're going to do it. That's biblical faith. Jackie, good morning. Those who believed also saw the urgency of baptism. Hey, that's an excellent point. They didn't wait for baptismal Sunday, did they? And that's a very common practice today in the denominational world. You'll have a, like a once a month, or maybe if there's three or four people who decide to, or who are saved, well, we'll go ahead and this Sunday and we'll do a baptismal service. You don't see that. Baptismal Sunday is not a thing biblically speaking. Um, they saw the urgency of baptism. Oh, the, the Philippian jailer, Acts chapter, and I know we haven't got there yet, but Acts chapter 16, they went the same hour of the night. He washed their stripes, and immediately he was baptized. Excellent point. Connie says denominations often have a baptism day. Huh. Okay, so one of us was reading somebody's mind. Denominations, denominations often have a baptism day when several people put off baptism until they're Baptism Day, yeah, Baptismal Sunday. And again, they, the teaching is they've already been saved. Baptism, and he, here's the thing, baptism is a, a public confession of the fact that you have been saved. If you can find that in the Bible for me, I would be interested to see it. I'll, uh, I'll await the answer. But that's what a lot of people, sadly, have been led to believe. That baptism is, well, the, I guess the most popular way it's phrased is that it's a, um, it's an outward expression of an inward experience. You've been saved, and uh, this is now, your baptism is expressing that you have been saved to everybody who doesn't know it yet. Again, not biblical. Not biblical. We need, to, we need to know, there are things that we need to know that we need to be certain of before we can be baptized properly. And I, I would say that's a whole other discussion. That could be a video in and of itself. What do I need to know before I become a Christian? Hmm, pretty interesting. I've got some pretty interesting thoughts there. Connie says, since they were not baptized for the proper reason, their baptism is worthless. 
correct? Correct. Hmm. Well, like I said, that would be a <laughs> that would be a whole other video. Uh, faith, so faith and baptism. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And Mark sixteen sixteen is a promise. It's not a command. If you do this and this, this is what will future tense happen to you. Well, believe in what? Obviously, there are some things that a person needs to understand, and I think we've kind of seen that throughout Acts so far. For instance, the people in Acts chapter 2, they were believing Jews. That's why they were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. They believed in the one God. They were looking, they were anticipating the Messiah, and 3,000 people responded positively. But they needed to repent. Uh, these Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, they needed to learn about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and then they could be baptized. The, the Ethiopian eunuch here, he didn't know who Christ was. He didn't know who, uh, who Isaiah was talking about. He needed to learn that. So there are things that need to be known and understood before you can be baptized properly. So here's a statement. Here's a very simple statement to remember. You cannot be taught wrong and be baptized right. You can't be taught wrong and be baptized right. Sheila says, if you don't believe, you are an atheist. Why would a non-believer consider baptism? Well, I actually did a, a podcast on this the other day, an article that B.J. Clark wrote back in 1996. I used it for the podcast. Uh, it's on Podbean and Spotify, and it's on Mark 16, 16. Um, and, and one of the, I've made this point, and, and he had made this point in this article. I've never had anybody come to me and say, listen, Barry, I don't believe in Jesus. Will you baptize me? <laughs> it's not going to happen. All right, guys, interesting discussion here. Went a little longer than I had planned, but uh, that's okay. I appreciate all of you who are on here today. Those of you watching on the Near Churches page, thank you. If you have any questions or comments further, even after the live stream is over, please feel free to use the comment section on either one of those pages. You can send me a private message or uh, whatever. But uh, we will plan on coming back tomorrow at 11 o'clock. We'll start looking at Acts chapter 9. I don't know how far we'll get in Acts chapter 9, to be honest with you, because there's so much there. We've already been introduced to Saul of Tarsus, but we're going to see some interesting events take place here in Acts chapter 9, and we'll just have to see how far we get. All right, guys, thank you for being here today. Uh, we'll be live streaming tonight at 7 o'clock here at Mammoth Spring if you're unable to get out. Uh, if you're under the weather or whatever and you're sitting at home, join us on the live stream. And we're, we're studying through hermeneutics, and tonight we're going to talk about the different types of literature in the Bible and why it's important to to know those particular things. All right, guys, have a good day. Hope to see you back here tomorrow at 11 o'clock for Acts chapter 9.